What's up, everybody? I've got my good friend Clint Casper uh, on the mic, and I, Clint, I don't think I've ever had you on the podcast. I know we've tried before. I couldn't. I've done so many. I couldn't remember if I've had you on before or not. Nope. This is my this is my maiden voyage. I figured, you know what? You're you're scraping the very bottom of the barrel. You're like, you know what? I'm. Mean, it's time to have Clint on. I'm like, you know what? Hey, I'll take it. I'll take the bottom, <laughs> man. I'll, I'm I'm okay with it. That's funny. Uh, the, uh, Jerry sent a list of. Uh, Dude, I don't know how many yesterday of people that we haven't had on, you know, and it's kind of, I mean, you, you read through it and you're like, oh, I haven't had him on. And then people will yep. message in and be like, hey, you know, you should have this person on. I'm like, I have twice. Like, really? I'm yep. like, we have, yeah, it's, it, we, I mean, we've had done so many, like I, for, oh, yeah. I forget who I have or haven't had on. And then a guy the other day was like, hey, you know, you should have this person. I got a hold of Jerry. Jerry's like, dude, you had him on before. I'm like, oh god, my memory sucks. I don't even remember having a podcast with him. I'm like, was it was it good? So I I could not remember if I'd had you on before or or not. That's how great my memory is, and how many of these damn things I've done. Oh yeah, no, I totally get it. And I mean, when I was you know when I was doing the CC Hunt files with with Kurt and the gang over at WCB, I had you on, you know, the CC files a couple times. So you probably you know just looking out for you. You probably honestly got some of that. I mean, you very well could have been like, Oh yeah, I've had Clint on and we did talk, we did do a podcast, but it was just on my end, not your end at the time. So, I mean, realistically that, that could also mess with you a little bit too. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it's definitely been, I think we just hit 12 million downloads on, uh, Kafaro cast. I don't know if that counts Podbean or, or not. I'm not sure, but it's all kind of a blur. Like, and I don't listen oh. to my own podcast. I don't know if you do, but like, I can't remember what I say. Like, I mean, parts, nope. not much. Nope. I've, I've always, I've always said that I did, I did a hundred episodes. Uh, episode 100 back in the fall was, was my last one with, with, for CC hunt files with, with uh, the WCB gang. And, uh, I just got to the point where it was just, I got so many irons in the fire. I just, I knew it was something that, I was going to have to give somewhere and give something up. So that was the one thing that I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the type of guy where I don't want to half-ass anything. And I told Kurt, I'm like, man, you know, after episode 100, I think I'm going to shut it down. I'm like, and, and just, I got so much stuff going on, irons in the fire. And I don't think people realize it's not just, oh, yeah, every week. Like I did, I did two, you know, two full years, never missed a week, uh, you know, one episode a week. So I did 100 of them. And I couldn't tell you six of those. Like it's, it's such a blur and people are like, Oh, it's not that hard. You just get on a mic for an hour and 20 minutes and you talk. And it's like, people don't realize, you know, guys that do it on the full time spectrum and do it on a stage as big as like, you know, what you're doing, what, what Kurt and WCB is doing, what meat eaters doing, you know, you start looking at the huge platforms. It is not just, Oh yeah, jump on for an hour and bullshit and that's it. I mean, it's a full time job to actually run like a a big platform style podcast. I mean, it's it's full time job. I mean, I saw that from doing my series, and my series was you know quite a bit smaller, obviously, than than what you guys have going on. And even still, I mean, the editing, lining up guests, just just getting guests on the phone i mean hell look at us we've tried three times in the last week to, you know to get this to work out i mean it's it's a lot more than what people think um it's not quite just as simple as you jump on you hit record and then that's it yeah it uh it definitely uh it's it taking some time and i i think that uh when you you kind of hit to a point and we're kind of here because we're going to start monetizing it uh, the podcast to a certain degree, right? Because we didn't, yeah. I mean, up until now, we haven't done, we just do podcasts. And so, yep. well, you know, what we wanted to do, uh, you know, biggest thing was obviously afford to fly people in. And when I say that, you can, I mean, we could just pay out of the Kafaru budget and, you know, take it out of marketing or whatever and fly people in. Yeah. But I want it to be self-sustainable. So we, we're bringing on a few different um, sponsors, just companies we already work with. It kind of simplifies things, but you know, then you're like coordinating the flights in the rooms, oh, yeah. you know, and, and, then obviously on the artwork or the, the, the side of like making the real and all that. I mean, it, yep. it's time consuming. I mean, I pay Jerry full time to do pretty yep. much the podcast. Oh, yeah. So. yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the social media end of it is, is, you know, 
when it comes to promoting it, I mean, there's, yeah, it's, it's not as easy as just hit record and then hit publish and put it out there. I mean, if you want it to actually do well and grow and, and get it to like the stage where you guys are at, yeah, it's, it's a full-time job for somebody. I mean, someone's editing, someone's doing clips, someone's doing reels. And I mean, you know, like I said, for many years, I got to see, you know, the behind the scenes, how all that worked with, with like Kurt and, and WCB. And I mean, yeah, if people only knew like what all goes into what like you guys are doing on a full-time podcast platform. It's uh, yeah, my, my, my heart goes out to Jerry. I've never, I've never met Jerry, but my heart goes out to him because I know for a fact, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot on that guy's plate. Um, a, a lot of behind the scenes bullshit that quite frankly, a lot of guys don't want to do or would never want to get paid to do. I'm, I'm honestly one of them. I mean, I, I couldn't do that full time. Uh, there's, they're just, I just, yeah, no way. That's, that's a whole nother level of patience. Yeah, well, yeah. And she, I mean, obviously then he has to listen to me all the time. So that's even, even worse. Um, <laughs> cause he has to listen to every episode beginning to beginning to the end. But, uh, <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's well, true. Well, tell everybody for anybody that's not paying attention, tell everybody a little bit about, you know, yourself. I mean, obviously we'll talk about some hunting stuff after that, but very successful, you know, Hunter getting after it all the time, but uh, kind of let everybody know where you're at. Yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so grew up here, Northeastern Ohio, still live here. Um, man, small towns, small uh, rural farm town here, Northeast. I mean, just for reference on, you know, Cleveland's like an hour away from me. So that'll kind of give everyone kind of knows where that where Cleveland's at pro football hall of fame is not too far away from me either. So definitely uh, that Northeastern side and uh, was, West to grow up uh, on a dairy farm and, and been farming my whole life. Um, you know, I had, in my opinion, you know, probably the two best role models I could have had for a mom and dad. My brother and I were really lucky. You know, we got to, we got to kind of watch the, we got to live and watch the hard work pays off uh, mantra to the fullest. So that was, that was awesome. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't trade our childhood growing up on the farm and in sports and the outdoors for anything. I mean, you know, my mom and dad never missed a, I mean, they never missed an art show, never missed a football game, never missed a, I mean, you know, just, just super supportive. And, and that was great. You know, I, I look around today in the way the world is and, uh, you know, it's, it, yeah, I, I, I'm actually more, you know, the older I get, the more I look back on that. And I'm just like, wow, me and my brother, like we are so damn lucky to have grown up in 4-H, in FFA, playing sports, you know, obviously hunting and fishing. And, and you know, I cut my teeth with, you know, here in Ohio, unfortunately, I don't have elk and antelope to go chase, um, which is why I started the Western migration, uh, you know, but I started out cutting my teeth on turkeys and whitetails. So at a, at a real young age, I mean, that was pretty much kind of where I started, you know, BB gun 22, squirrels, groundhogs. I mean, you know, dad was always kind of throwing me out there to, hey, you know, this alfalfa field's got 47 holes in it. We got to do something like sit out there for three hours and, and, and get some of these groundhogs killed or, you know, whatever. So from a very young age, got involved in the outdoors. And I mean, just kind of took off. I mean, I was, you know, if I, if I wasn't bass fishing, I was freaking scouting for turkeys or, or looking for sheds or just, you know, constantly in the woods, um, played football my whole life. And I've always been a giant sports fan, but I'll be honest, you know, the older I got, the more I was like, man, when football season ends, that's right about the time the rut starts. I'm like, ah, you know, I, I, uh, I quit playing basketball because basically I wanted to hunt the rut. Um, and you know, there's, there's times in today's world now where I'm like, you know, maybe I should have played those four years cause I'm never going to get those high school days back. But then I'm like, ah, man, I shot some good bucks and had some damn good times chasing deer around in the rut. So I'm like, ah, you know what? It was worth it. But but yeah, dairy farm and, and, and grew up, um, you know, in the outdoors and, and, and had all those, you know, my mom and dad gave me the opportunities to, you know, kind of have the, I guess, the belief that, you know, I could kind of do whatever I wanted to do, you know. So I went to college and actually went to college for criminal justice, psych and soch, wanted to go into the, uh, wanted to go into the prison systems. Honestly, I got an aunt and an uncle that were both wardens down by Columbus and wanted to go into that. And I always had an interest in uh in writing and I, I used to always say when i was a little kid i'm like you know if all else fails i'm like i'm just gonna write for hunting magazines my mom and dad tell stories all the time about 
you know, I'd be five, six years old and I'd be eating my dinner and I'd be looking at a deer and deer hunting magazine, reading something from Charles Alzheimer or, or, or somebody. And I'm like six, seven years old, whatever. And I'm like, yep, one of these days I'm going to be in here. And, and mom and dad always joke because they're like, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're sure you will, you know, I'm sure you will. And, uh, got to college and I had to write this paper and it was a how to paper. And I didn't know what I was going to write about. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to write a how-to paper on how to bow hunt whitetails. And my professor, he gives me my paper back. And it says on the top, it goes, see me after class. Doesn't have a grade on it. But, you know, I'm, I'm 19 years old. I'm like, oh, great. Like, this dude's probably like a PETA guy. Like, I'm just like, oh, wow, I probably really fucked myself here, right? So I go up there, and he goes, listen. He goes, this is not really a topic. Like, this, is, this hasn't, like, I, I was not really meaning to be that vague with to write about anything, but he's like, I've never hunted a day in my life, but he's like, Clint, this is like, this is really, really good. Like, he's like, have you ever thought about doing some writing or, or like, he's like, he's like, you've, you've got like a talent here. And I'm like, no, I mean, I mean, yes, but no, you know? And so I kind of thought about it. I was 19 then. I kind of started thinking about that. I'm like, man, that would be really cool. You know? So about two years later, I kind of made the switch. I was like, you know what? graduated college, got a, I got a state job, started working. And I was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start pitching some ideas and just start writing some stuff. And I'm going to start pitching it. And I'm just going to start sending it to some of these editors. And I mean, I was sending stuff to back in, the, you know, back then bow and arrow hunting was still there with Joe Bell. And, you know, obviously you had field and stream still and outdoor life and deer and deer hunting. And I don't know how many of these articles I've pitched. I mean, I must have sent, oh, I don't know, 20. And I had a few small little local magazines and local like newspapers that let me do some writing. And they're like, yeah, man, why don't you write, you know, write us a story or write us a how to. And at that point I killed a bunch, you know, killed a bunch of long beards kind of all over the surrounding States by me, killed a bunch of good whitetails, but hadn't ventured out West was just pretty much whitetails and turkeys. That's where I was at at that point in time in my early twenties. And uh, I'm like, man, I'm like, I need to venture out more. I'm like, that would be, you know, I need to, I need to be a little more well-rounded. I felt like I was kind of pigeonholed in. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start going, going out West. And then that's going to give me more adventures and more stuff I can write about. So started, I started off in Colorado, which for the first three years was a total disaster. I mean, I learned a lot, but I got my ass handed to me. Like, I think I was 22, 23, 24. Um, and just, you know, most of it solo backpack style, just on my own. Like mom and dad thought I was an idiot. They're like, we'll never see you again. I mean, I'll never forget the first trip I went out there. My mom and dad basically was like telling me goodbye as if like they was never going to see me again. Like I literally don't think that they thought I was going to come back home. Like they were scared to death. And I'm like, listen, everybody does this out there. Like it's just not people here doing it. But so, you know, went out there three years in a row, three different units, 28 to 30 hours in my truck by myself, do all this backpack hunting. I'm chasing mule deer. And I'm like, man, I'm like, you know, the, the more adventure I'm going on, the more bow hunting I'm doing, I'm just like, man, I got to find a way to like make some money and do this. And uh, at that point in time, I was starting to think about, you know, cause I had just the regular eight to four job working Monday through Friday, government job, pretty good pay, good benefits, decent amount of time off. But I'm just like, man, just isn't really honestly it doesn't light my soul on fire like you know I'm just like and I mean I was still farming with my dad which I really love to do but I'm just like you know I don't know this just isn't really it for me it's just it's just not fulfilling like I just didn't feel like I had a huge purpose and uh I got a real lucky break um when I was uh 25 I shot a 191 inch whitetail on opening day here in Ohio and I'm I'm good buddies with uh with Levi Morgan and I had been texting him all summer about that. Um, back in the day, I used to shoot a lot of, I used to shoot a lot of indoor five spot Vegas, had my pro card and, and, and I would, you know, obviously wasn't doing it to the extent he was, but I was doing a lot of the bigger shoots, Vegas and different things and um, got to be pretty good buddies with him. And when I shot that buck, he pitched the idea to Christian Berg, who at the time was the head editor of Peterson's bow hunting. Now it's switched over to bow hunter, but, so Christian gets a hold of me, um, and 
basically that's what got the ball rolling for me. I got my first feature article in Peterson's bow hunting, which was like, you know, that was like, to me, it was life changing. Cause I had been waiting and waiting for an opportunity. And I don't know how many, you know, articles I had sent in, but I, I shoot this great buck. It's a, it's a, it's a two year story shoot him on opening night. He's like, man, I really want that story. And that opened the floodgates, man. And then, you know, that, that kind of led into, well, Hey man, if you're going out West and you're, you're killing stuff out there, you know, we'll, we'll take some more stuff from you. And Hey man, we'll take some Turkey stuff from you. And so that's kind of how I like got my break, I guess, to where I'm at now, where basically I'm farming with my dad and in the hunting industry full time. That's kind of how, kind of how that all, that all transpired. But yeah, you know, I, I always say, I always give a huge, you know, a huge shout out to, to Levi. Cause I mean, he, he kind of threw it out there to Christian, like, Hey man, you, 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 you know, I know the story. I know the buck, like you need to give, you need to give this guy an opportunity to write your feature article. Like this is a, this is a good deal, man. Like, you know, you're going to want this one. And uh, yeah, here we are today. Now I'm on, I'm on Kfaru cast. See how that all works. It, it, it's all come full circle. See? Uh, that's funny. It's so it's funny to bring up like the writing thing because I was talking to I think Kenneth and Dan about this the other day. Because how, how old are you? I think I got you by a little bit, but how old are you now? I'm th- I turned thirty five in November. Yeah, so I'm so thirty five. I've got some age on you, but obviously you're old enough. You know, rewind another ten more from from you or more. The social media thing in the beginning wasn't there. Was it wasn't there, right? Or it, you know, it the, how you got. Yep how you got to be known and you know, you've got people nowadays like bashing um, anybody of notoriety is going to get bashed even if they're oh, old. Yeah. And when I say that, oh, yeah. that they're doing it for fame or they're doing it for whatever. But the reality is if you're, you know, a few years older, you were doing it in the beginning. The only way to get known was writing. Yep. And yeah. Oh yeah. And yep. when I say that, you could forums were out there too, but you know, really like the yep. broad spectrum, you were still had to at least write something on a forum, right? I mean, you had to. Yep. And so that writing, the ability to write was far more important than the clickbait stuff because you couldn't really clickbait an article. You wanted that first paragraph to grab right. your listener. You know, you wanted yep, it. Absolutely. To, and, and you were always very good at that. And, and that's what I was trying to convey was like, hey, just like hunting, load the quiver like fully with everything to succeed, learn how to write, yeah. you know, obviously everybody's got to learn social media. Now, if you make a, a, a living in the industry to a certain degree, you got to at least have a page for the most part. Um, oh yeah. But back then it was, it was, it was writing and times have changed. You, you and I, I mean, are, are known, but man, we're relatively unknown compared to some people that I don't, I'm not, I don't have TikTok, you know, and I have an Instagram page, but you know, to have the full package back then, you just needed to be able to write well. Now, you yeah. need to know TikTok, yep. Instagram, when to post, how to post, hashtag. I don't do any of that shit. So t- times have changed. I, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on that, I guess, because you've been around the block. And, you know, even at, at 35, shit was different when you started. A lot different. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can remember... I started with Peterson's bow hunting and then that's, you know, Christian Berg and I have become kind of best friends from that moment on. He comes out here and hunts with me basically every fall, every spring. He's brought his kids out for years. Uh, his son actually shot a great buck last year at my place uh, for the youth hunt, the youth gun season, his last, his last year youth hunting out here. And he, he, uh, yeah, he took home a freaking whopper out here, like 140 inch uh, mainframe eight. But, uh, it started right there for me and it was kind of one of those deals where I noticed after a few years of doing some writing there. So that puts me like in my mid twenties, I'm like 25, 26. Then I started doing some stuff for like field and stream and bow hunter and deer and deer hunting. And then I, I did a few for uh, uh, like North American whitetail and, and I started getting recognized for that. You know, I'd be, I'd be somewhere and someone would be like, hey, you're Clint Casper. And I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, what, what, uh, okay, why'd I piss you off? Hey, man, I read that article last month in so-and-so. Like, dude, that was, that was a banger. That, you did a hell of a job. I, I learned a lot on that. I'm like, oh, you know, and it, it was kind of weird because I'm like, you know, I mean, I was just 
small town country kid that, I mean, I, you know, I've been bow hunting and doing my thing since I was a little kid. So now I'm just putting it out there for people. So it was kind of weird to sort of get to, you know, get like not just locally known, but you know, like you'd be somewhere and be like, Hey man, I, you know, yeah, I, I remember hunting some, some state ground in Pennsylvania, um, a couple hours away from me. And I ran into a guy at a gas station and he's like, dude, he's like, I follow all your stuff in deer and deer hunting. He's like, you need to write more for them. And I remember thinking like, wow, like this dude lives in, and he wasn't even from PA. He was from another state. I, I forget the state he was from, but he, he knew me through writing columns for deer and deer hunting. And I'm like, man, that's wild. Well then about that point in time, social media starts to kind of creep you know, at that point in time, it's really starting to kind of take off, you know, Facebook and, and whatever. So I'm like, well, like you said, you've got to kind of do that stuff. Um, so that was kind of a change for me because, yeah, you know, like you were saying, it's, uh, it's kind of like learning stuff all over again. Like I went from just being like, hey, I'm going to write and take my own photos and put my stuff out there to – wow, now I've got these platforms that I can actually promote everything I'm doing and quote unquote team up with other platforms or companies. And then, and then, you know, like there's way to make dollar value there. And yeah, it is. It's such a different world because, you know, like just like the podcast world, like I've got so many guys that know me from being on, you know, different podcasts and, and, and being, you know, being connected to, you know, different people in the podcast world. And it's just, yeah, it's, there's, there's so much going on now. And when I started, it was just, Hey, I want to be known as a writer and I want to go on hunts and I want to go, you know, hopefully punch tags with my bow and talk about what I did and, and take photos and put it out there for the world. And it's like, I, yeah, I did that for like two years. And then that drastically, like it had to change. I mean, I remember sitting down with, with Christian at one point, he's like, Hey man, you know, uh, the online stuff's getting pretty big. Like we'd like you to do some online blog stuff. You know, that, that, that got pretty hot and heavy five, six years ago, you know? And it's like now at this point, I mean, right now, present day, I probably write, you know, 20, 30 feature articles a year for various magazines. And, and I'm a, I'm a magazine guy. I mean, call me old school all you want, but I like to sit on the shitter and physically hold a magazine and say, oh, look, I'm going to read this story from Aaron Snyder, or I'm going to read this story for, from Jace Bowser. Like, I, I like to physically have a magazine, but that's, that's old. That's old news. I probably do, oh, my gosh, I probably write over 100 online articles. So, so, so my ratio is probably like 20, 30 feature articles in magazines now to maybe 80 or a hundred blog style stuff. It's not even close. So like just that in itself has changed so much, which I mean, I get it. Everyone's got their phone. That's the way of the world. But like, even just that from a writing standpoint, it's so crazy to me to even think that, you know, writing in a magazine is kind of an old school thing now. And, and everybody wants the blog stuff. Everybody wants a thousand words, a few photos, and throw it up online. Like that's, that's really where most of my work comes from. Like most of my, my money that comes from writing in the hunting industry is mainly internet sourced blog style. I mean, you know, that's, that's just the reality of it. So yeah, it is. It's, it's, you were spot on. It's crazy. Like how the changes have happened and you've got to be able to adapt to that. And like you said, you know, whether you're young, old, whatever, if you're on the internet and you're putting yourself out there and you're, you're especially in the hunting world, I mean, yeah, you're going to deal with the hate and the shade and the bullshit. I mean, that's just like, that's just part of it. I mean, you're, you're, it's, you know, it's inevitable. You're going to deal with that. Um, that's just, uh, unfortunately that's, that's all part of it too. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've told people that have asked me like, Hey, the one thing, if you just write in print, Right. When I say just right, yep. if you just write for yep. print and you stay off social media, you will, yep. you will be blind to everything and live a happy life. Oh, for sure. <laughs> but yep. Oh, absolutely. You, you for won't, sure. you won't gain like you probably should no. or, or could. And so nope. right now, like rewind back into the, the nineties, uh, two thousands, right. For me, yep. Chuck Adams was the big one. Um, oh yeah. 
back, you know, XX 78 sloop, super slam selects running four inch Marco veins. And then, then Omer, Omer kind of, I'll just say Randy Omer. Yep. Yep. And they, and they made, well, Chuck specifically, Randy was, he made money on, he was a veterinarian, but you know, Chuck was yeah. actually making bow hunted, but me, I, I, I was the one that kind of got into it, which everyone thinks is fucking crazy. Cause that's all I want to do is bow hunt, but n- nobody, nobody bow hunted, but my dad knew about Chuck Adams from me constantly talking about him and showing him the articles. And I mean, my poor mom and dad had to literally look at so much bow hunting content that they acted like they cared, but in all reality, they had a million things going on and probably, you know, we're just like, oh my God, he's making us look at another. But I was just amazed at what, you know, Randy Almer and, and Joe Bell and these guys were all doing at the time as writers in the industry. My dad caught wind that Chuck was going to be at this, this event. He goes, hey, Clint, we're going to go to this hunting show. And I was like, oh, cool. Well, I didn't know Chuck Adams was going to be there. So my dad kind of like surprised me, right? So I, I'm we walk in and there's this big sign of him and it says like meet and greet. And then he had these little, I still have it. It was a little like a eight by four um, printout of him with a big bull elk. And it had uh, his super slam arrows lined around the outside of it. And, and when you went up to meet him, he'd sign one for you and he'd give it to you. Well, I go up there and I mean, you'd swear to Christ, I'm meeting Michael Jordan. I mean, I'm just like, I'm fucking losing my shit right I, like i said i'm probably like 10 to 12 and i remember <laughs> i remember i met him and he was so like you said he was so like hey how you doing you know what's your name i'm clint you know good to meet you clint and, and it's funny because he was such a dry like you said such a dry character which not not shaming him by any means that's just how he was but i remember my <laughs> my dad said to chuck he goes yeah, he goes, Clint here, he, uh, man, he'd love to make a living doing what you're doing. And he looked at both of us and he goes, so I guess you, what you're saying is he doesn't want to have much money and he doesn't want to have a lot of food in the fridge. And he started to laugh. And to be honest with you, like, now, mind you, I've seen him a hundred times since then. That's probably the most animated comment that I've ever really seen him give. And like, I'll never forget that because it was the first time I ever met him. And it's one of those things where it's like, like you said, you know, he just doesn't have much animation to him, but every now and again, he'll give you a little, a little laugh or a joke, you know? And uh, it's just funny. Cause when I think about that, I'm like, man, he probably talked to 500 people that day and probably 485 of those. It was just a, hi, good to meet you. How you doing? Have a good show. Okay. You know, just very, just kind of run of the mill, you know, yep, oh, yeah, the sky's blue, the grass is green, like, but then you go talk to, like you said, like a Fred Eichler or somebody, and it's just the complete opposite. You're like, man, what drugs is that guy on? I want to be on him, too. Like, that dude's wound for sound every single day of his life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, when you when you go, like, I, <clears throat> a bit socially awkward in large groups of people, like, I'm a bit introverted, getting better, you know, but I, I it's, it's, it's a struggle for me, unless I'm drinking, which that's not good. There's kind of a happy medium in there. You don't want to <laughs> right. go in too shit faced, right? But I, you know, admittedly, I mean, I've quit drinking recently, but I, I, you know, I would take probably four shots of screwball somewhere between noon and two. So people didn't think I was so fucking awkward, right? And you can't right. tell, that's right. not very much alcohol for me. Not that that's anything to be proud of, but. It was definitely something where I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? Good to see you. Shit, you drove out from right, Iowa? Right. Where before I'd be, hey, hey, wow, how how far was the drive, right? Where it would open. Right. Me, where Eichler, you're like, is he on Coke and alcohol? Right. That fucking guy. Right. Like, he, right. hey, everyone. It's like, wow, he's pretty happy. You know, like, uh, the building's on fire, everybody. Grab your hats and let's make popcorn. He's just always right. going. Yeah, you know? shit. <laughs> but, uh, absolutely. I, so with the uh, you have subject of of you know the writing thing or whatever like your know, times have have are, are changing the one thing that it when I brought up about you know people saying oh you're doing it for the the, the only reason why I brought that up is if you started a long time ago like we did you know and you'll see people which rightfully so some people only do it for the fame or right. They're not doing it for yeah. what I would consider the right reasons. Like I've heard people say, you know, before laugh. And I mean, I shouldn't even say this out loud, but you know, Oh, you're doing it for the gram. And I'm thinking, 
Oh, yeah, oh, heard, you, yep, yep. If it wasn't for Instagram, you should see the damage I would do on the animal population. If anything, social media yep. is slowing me down because I don't want people to oh. think I'm some blunt thirsty. And and what I'm getting at, when you were, the way you were raised, the way I was raised, that was just what you did. There was no yeah. reason. To, I mean, there was no posting anything like shooting shit. I shouldn't have been shooting with a BB gun. Trapping shit. Yep. I certainly shouldn't have been trapping. Um, you know, doing hood rat shit as a kid, right? That's why yep. we're both good shots. Good hand-eye coordination started at birth, right? I mean, and then you as a cattle rancher, I bet your dad worked the shit out of you in your single to teen years. So you've only known hard work since you were young. Nothing wrong with being raised in the city. I'm saying it's, it's different. And yep. that, you know, now again, the easy button, you can hit that easy button, and back then, when I say easy button, talk about the knowledge and everything else. But when you were raised only doing this, it's just different than, and I'm not, I'm not disparaging the younger generation at all on this, but when you didn't have a rangefinder or you were so gracious to have one and you had to learn from your local pro shop how to tune your bow and you just yep. hunted to hunt. I think it gives you a different perspective on hunting to me. Like when you shot your mule deer, you didn't fly out of the tree stand to post a photo of it. Cause there was nowhere to post it. Or, or you know what I oh, mean? Like yeah. you, you had to go back yeah. and write an article. I mean, you were just yeah. happy to shoot the fucking thing and it had nothing to do with anything other than that was your passion. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. I, and, and you know, it's, I've often said this to people, you know, I'm blessed and grateful for what social media has provided me because I've met a lot of really fucking cool people and a lot of them I now call best friends and I've been granted a ton of fucking really kick-ass opportunities and places I've been and I mean my, you know, my two little boys are definitely going to benefit from the connections and the things there that I've made but if someone told me tomorrow all social media is fucking over it truthfully i'd throw a party and buy a 30 rack of bush light and i'd tell everyone don't bother me for a day uh it would not like for me it it, it you know it, i mean it's it's fun and it can be fun but when you're doing it at the level um, that like you're doing it or, or I'm doing it to promote what I'm doing and you're trying to make money in the industry and you're trying to do certain things. I mean, it's just one of those things where it's like it gets fucking exhausting and people don't realize, you know, when you, like someone like yourself, if you're putting, you're putting all this stuff out there online, right? So you're opening up the floodgates for everybody in the world to not only clap and cheer for you, but to fucking hate on you and judge you. So it's not as simple as just, well, I'm going to post this photo. No, no. You better make sure if you're posting a photo with a gun, the fucking barrel's not pointed at someone. <laughs> or God forbid, God forbid your kid's in the photo and he's closer to the gun than you because you're going to get ridiculed. Oh, my God. What if he grabbed that gun and you're not looking? I'm like, Jesus, fuck. He's right he's right beside me, man. The gun's unloaded. Like it's not, I mean, you gotta be like looking at every little, you know, I mean, I'm a writer, but I misspell shit, especially on social media. Oh my God, the grammar police. I mean, if I use the wrong two or I, I misspell something, Oh geez, I'd love to be buying your article because you can't even put an Instagram post up that's spelled right. I'm just like, fuck man. I'm sorry. I took two minutes to hurry up and bust this out. And you're right. I misspelled the word, you know, I used the wrong there. Yeah. My bad, man. Like, my bad. I mean, so it, it is. It's one of those things where it's like you, you, you got to do it. But if it all ended, I'm still going to fucking bow hunt. And I'm still going to have my kids outdoors. And I'm still going to do everything I've been doing my whole life. I'm just now not going to have it out there for everybody else to see. And to be honest, that wouldn't really change my life as far as I would just have to find a different route to probably make money. Cause that would obviously change certain things that I'm doing. Right. But would I still be chasing elk and mule deer and antelope 50, 60 days a year out West driving from Ohio, clear the 
fuck out to Utah and Colorado and Wyoming and Yes, I'd still be doing that if Instagram died tomorrow. You'll still find me in September chasing elk. Late August is going to be high country mule deer. You'll still see me chasing running mule deer in November. I mean, nothing, like none of that would change for me. And, and, I mean, I know you're the same way. So it is kind of funny to hear, hear guys be like, oh, Snyder just, he only does it for the gram. He only does it. It's like, man, he's been <laughs> – like, you know, guys like yourself and, like, the Levi Morgans of the world, I mean – We've been doing this stuff since way before this stuff ever came about. Yeah. It's just now we're putting it out there because you have to. And I, you know, I don't think people realize one. I'm almost fucking fifty. Well, I say almost fifty. I just turned, no, I just turned forty-seven. So I, I'm getting close to fifty, right? So right. I didn't have cell phones, right, until right. I mean, well, and I mean, you know, well, you know, into my, I don't know, whatever shit. I, I, I think the first cell phone I had was 2001 time frame, 2000, you know, so, yep. but, but I'm, there's a lot to unbox. I did not expect the uh, conversation to go this way, but I mean, laughing about some of this, I have gotten hated on because I have, uh, I mean, I get hated all the time, but one of the things I got hated on was uh, me saying, you know, I'd like to back out of social media and yeah. Well, yeah. for example, uh, and, and I tried to explain this politely and then I just gave up to a few people that were really like, Oh, typical Snyder, uh, going to back out on everyone, got to where he was because of social media. And my thing was like, hey, when you work a job, eventually the idea is to retire. And yeah. I don't, I can't imagine Clint Casper loves cattle ranching so much that if he did it long enough that eventually he might retire, hand it down to someone else and not go fuck around with shit and, and, uh, cows and milking and branding now you might still help out and dive into that every now and then but the idea is you know you might back out of that now that doesn't mean i'm backing out of hunting right nor would you back out of the outdoors right. or helping out but the the beet meat and potatoes of cattle ranching if that's your true love that's one thing if you like it and it's a means to an end it's how you make money that's another thing where hunting right. is always there for me that's never going away but social media is something where I look at it's more like a job. And so I was trying to explain that like, well, eventually, yeah, yeah. I just kind of want to write a book, write some articles, do some seminars, go hunting, you know? And so it's crazy. And I've tried to explain this, like, be careful what you wish for on the younger generation. When I'm kind of talking to guys is like, hey, make sure you set yourself up to where that you don't end up hating what you do because you're so right. involved in it. You know, you got to yep. have an outlet. Yep. No, absolutely. That's, that's very well said. I mean, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more, you know, I mean, uh, like I said, I mean, I was, I've been bow hunting and doing this way before I was farming and milking cattle and grain farming and doing all that way before. And it's it just like, it's one of those things that's just, it's just engraved in me. It's what I do. And I'm always going to do it. There'll probably come a day in time where I do leave the social media world because I just don't have to do it anymore. And it's like, man, honestly, like, that won't hurt my feelings. I mean, because like you said, it, it turns into a job. Like I love being able to, to bow hunt and, and that in, in the hunting industry has been so good to me on, on avenues of being able to, you know, make part of my income. And, 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 you know, like, like I said, my, my boys are going to have a lot of great opportunities because of it and certain things there. And it's like, that's awesome. But the social media part of it and certain parts of what comes with it, you know, everybody, it's funny. Everyone always says, Oh, it must be nice to be Clint Casper. Just get paid to hunt. And I'm like, I've not yet been paid by anyone to go on a hunting trip. Like I'm like, it, you know, I always hear that. Oh, must be nice to hunt for a living. And I'm like, man, <laughs> if you guys only saw what I do to make money in this industry, like, <laughs> it would blow your guy's mind because no one's paying me to go wander around the Montana woods in the mountains looking for an elk. I'm actually not getting paid to go do that. I mean, contrary to popular belief, like that's not where I'm making money. No one's paying me to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not, you know, I think it, uh, well, people will figure it out one way or another, I guess, because you get a lot of guys that'll definitely say, and gals, you know, how do I make it in the outdoor industry? And I'm like, uh, yeah. yep. Make sure you, one, you know what you're wishing for. Like have a, cause my thing is like, Hey, are you just wanting to be outdoors? Because the outdoor industry yep. is probably not the way to go. If you want, right. if you want to yep. be outdoors, become a guide, 
that's one way. Go be a fireman, yep. uh, uh, you know, uh, EMT, uh, uh, some, uh, something where you get like a very liberal schedule. Um, yep. If, you know, but if you want to be, I mean, technically you go work at Sportsman's Warehouse, you're in the outdoor industry. Like how, what are you wanting to do? Yep. Are you wanting notoriety? Are you just wanting to yep. put shit on the ground? Are you just not wanting to be in a building? Well, most outdoor industry jobs, you're probably going to be working like a, like a, you know, one-legged man in an ass kicking contest for for a while, not doing oh, yeah. what you want to do. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, yeah, like I said, it's something you want to really think about what you're wanting before you try to dive into actually, you know, quote unquote, work in the industry because very few people are lucky enough to, to, to get to do or or hunt you know, as, as, as much as, as someone like myself or whatever, I've been very lucky with that. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's taken a long time to build up to, you know, build up to that and get it to that point. I mean, it isn't like you just woke up one day and said, you know what? Yep. I'm just going to hunt 150 days a year. That's just, yep. I, that's just how I'm going to make my living. Like, yeah, it'll all work out a little bit, a little bit more difficult than that. Yeah, there was it was an uphill road to hoe, that's for sure. Um, but uh, I do I do have just some questions. Just uh, you, you're on. People are going to ask. Give everybody kind of your rundown archery setup. Like I, I, you know, inevitably somebody will ask, like, oh, what broadhead does he shoot? Does he like heavy arrow, light arrow? How many pounds? What bow? What yep. sight? Multi pin? Kind of a deep dive into your archery setup. Yeah. Yep. So been with Matthews a long time. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. I get to test and shoot a new bow from them every year. So running, running the lift, uh, the 29, uh, man, loving that thing. That thing's been, uh, right out of the, right out of the gate. I, uh, you know, it's, I'll be honest. It took me a long time to get used to the changing bows all the time thing. Cause when I grew up, you know, I bought a bow or my mom and dad, I would talk them into getting me one for Christmas or something. And you'd have it for, you know, four or five years. And it's like, man, you got so used to it. And now it's like, I change stuff all the time because, you know, the companies I'm working for, you know, new arrows, new broadheads, new this, new that, you know, they obviously, they want you to shoot the new stuff, you know, all the time, which is great. But um, this bow right out of the gate, I felt like I had had it a long time. Really, really love just the whole platform on that bow. Um, You know, as as far as riser and and just the way, you know, that they've changed some things up on that cam and the way the axles are and, I just, yeah, I've, I've really, really, really had a fun time getting that bow set up and shooting it. Um, I'm not, so for me, I'm 27 inch draw. Um, I'm probably a little shorter than most, most guys that were me would probably run 27 and a half, 28. Um, I'm a back tension guy. Uh, I, I hunted with a hinge for 10 years. I've now switched over the last few years back to a button. I run a, uh, an ultra view. I run that button with, um, They've got that new little, uh, it's called the hex. It's, it's that, uh, it's got like a, it's got a knurled <clears throat> knob on it that man, when I wrap my thumb around, it just fits right in that crease every single time. And it's got, instead of it being round, it's almost like squared off and it's got edges to it and really, really love that. But, but my, my point with all that is, is I'm a, I'm a straight back tension guy. Um, I like, you know, push and pull. I pull probably six. I'm, I'm probably 60, 40 on that, you know, or, or I guess I should say 40, 60 on pushing and pulling. Um, so with that being said, I like, a, I'd rather have a, a bow that's a little short draw length than one that's a little bit long for me personally. Like if you handed me a bow that's 26, I would probably shoot it better than a bow that's 27 and a half. Just the style I shoot, the way I shoot, uh, I don't like to be stretched out. I pull hard into that back wall. Um, so, you know, for me, I don't get too crazy into the heavy arrow, uh, the heavy arrow thing. I'm usually always like this year I'm running axis, Eastern axis, four millimeters. Um, I'm running the 55 grain. I'm running those, their new, uh, half out systems, which I know everyone's got an opinion on the half outs. Some are pretty good. Some suck. Some aren't good at all. I really like these. Um, I've had a lot of good luck with them so far. Um, ran gold tips for years and, and, and kind of had the same thing with the Pierce Platinums. Um, you know, I, I've, had, I've had pretty good luck with those systems. I'm usually always in that 435 to 450 range. For me, you know, whether it's whitetails, elk, mule deer, um, I'm an accuracy guy and – 
I've always looked at it as if I hit an elk in the shoulder with my draw weight, you know, maxed out 70 pound bow with my draw length, my kinetic energy, et cetera, I'm fucked. I'm in trouble no matter what. So I go with, okay, what's the most forgiving, accurate setup I can have? So I like being in that 280 to 290 feet per second. Uh, I like a solid front of center. You know, if I can be in that 15, 16 ish range, I mean, even if you could get a little more, I mean, that, that's great. You know, I mean, I definitely don't want to be back in that like 12%. I, I definitely love having solid front of center. Um, but I'm looking for most quiet, forgiving setup that I can get with still having some decent speed. Um, I have been a single pin guy for a long time. Switched over to an ultra view slider this year. Loving that. Um, I'm running the three pin on it right now. And for turkey and bear hunts, that's what I'm going to run. But what's nice about that site is you can, I have the double pin vertical and I got a single pin vertical and you can switch out those cartridges and still run the same marks and same yardage tape. So like, for example, on a high country, early season mule deer hunt, Typically, I'm stalking a buck that's bedded or a buck that's feeding. In a scenario like that, I'll be honest, I love having a single pin. I don't like a ton of cluster and bullshit going on um, in, my, in, my sight, um, in my sight picture. But let's say I'm going to hunt rutting elk in Montana or I'm going to chase bucks in Ohio or Iowa for whitetails during the rut in November. It's really awesome to have three pins that are vertical or, or uh, that are horizontal because, you know, I've got three different yardages all marked out and shit happens so fast. You got stuff running around. So I've gotten away from just being a single pin vertical guy in the last few years, because it, there is a really good benefit to running a pin or running, you know, multiple pins and not just relying on always having to move that. Now, I'm the type of guy where I've always gotten used to, okay, if my pin set at 20 and I'm a single pin guy and the animals at 35, where do I got to hold? I, you know, I'm, this is, this is going back to the old school days. I got really good at gap shooting. I got really good at learning with one pin, what to do, how to shoot. Okay. It's at 30, the bucks at 40. I know where I need to hold and that's all fine and dandy, but sometimes it, it's just nice to have a reference and be able to just be like, okay, my pins are at 20, 30, 40. Okay. The bucks at 38. Okay. I got a pin at 40. I'm going to hold it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I've kind of switched that up in the last few years um, when it comes to that, you know, and, and there again, with my setup, I like being in that 280 to 290. That gives me a pretty good buffer. It's not lightning fast, but it's not super slow, very quiet, very forgiving. You know, I can be off, a yard or so, maybe two at most ranges, and it's not drastically killing me. Now, you know, I've had some setups that I've tried back in the day that were 450, 465, and I'll be honest, I mean, one yard, one and a half yards, I mean, I was really, <laughs> I was really, really losing out um, on my setup. So for me, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't get into the super heavy arrow deal. Um, Broadhead wise, man, I've been a sever guy through and through um, for, oh man, I tested those things out before they ever hit the market. And to be honest, I've never looked back. I've probably killed between bears, antelope, turkey. I mean, you name it. I mean, I've probably killed well over a hundred animals with the severs. And I mean, I've, I've absolutely, I've loved those things. I shoot all three of them. Um, and you know, everyone's got their, oh, I hate mechanicals or, I hate fixed blades for me. Hey, if you can get it to fly good and you have confidence in it, I mean, that's the number one thing for me is you just, you got to have confidence in your setup. I've had a lot of confidence in those. I shoot them in practice field mode all the time, all summer long, you know? So, I mean, I'm basically shooting, you know, six of those things in practice mode all summer, um, which is mimicking exactly like how it's going to be out in the field, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, now some of the solids I have shot when I hunt states like, you know, Idaho, for example, um, I've shot the kudus. I've liked those. Obviously, iron wheels I've shot. I mean, really like those. I mean, those are probably the, you know, the cat's ass if you're going to go the fixed blade route. But, um, you know, if you give me my, hey, you can shoot whatever you want. 
Yeah, man, it's pretty hard for me to go away from a sever. I'm not going to lie. I've, uh, I've had really good luck. Those things fly like darts for me, and, and they've, been, uh, they've been super, super solid for me over the last seven, eight years. I've killed a, killed a lot of shit with them. So it's been, it's been fun to run those. But, um, yeah, that's probably the, the main majority, I guess, of kind of my, my setups and whatnot. Um, but let's unravel a little bit of that because this is good because I do these Q&As and people ask me, a lot of questions about the, uh, you know, where the parameters are for a, a mechanical. And, and I'm, um, you know, obviously when I'm shooting a stick, I'm a fixed blade guy, but I, I like mechanicals right. on a compound. And yep. you and I, our, our setups are pretty close in the sense of I, you shoot 435, I shoot 465 to 475, yep. but that's because my draw length's longer um, and I shoot a little yep. more poundage. I like that happy medium of 270 to 285, 275 to yep. 285, somewhere in there. And yep. uh, speed-wise, that seems to be the happy medium for noise, tunability, um, yeah. and I'm, I'm used to it. And I I personally, and, and I, um, you, you said the thing, confidence is key. You know, yep. when people are like, hey, 27-inch draw, um, you know, I'm going elk hunting, what broadhead? Can I use a mechanical? Yes. Yep. Hey, uh, what if I hit the shoulder? Well, you said it. You're fucked. <laughs> in, you're fucked anyway, right? It's not going. Oh, you're fucked. Yeah. E yeah. Even with yeah, my setup, um, unless I hit the thin part of the scap, um, I'm pro. It's gonna be iffy, right? I mean, I mean, if I hit the knuckle, it ain't going through. And I've oh, there's always the unicorn. There was a dude shooting whatever, and he hit the knuckle and killed it. Okay, well, there's fucking yep. one. Right. There's yeah. one out, you know, yeah. out of millions of bow yep. hunters, elk hunters. So like the thing is, is confidence wise, if you're shoot, I mean, I wouldn't shoot personally. Like I wouldn't suggest shooting a giant, holy shit, like a two inch wide, um, uh, sever, um, on something like a moose or a elk. Um, I'm not saying it won't go through with your setup, but at 2770, an inch and a half broadhead at a 430, yeah. 40 grain arrow, you can shoot damn near anything, including a moose yep. without much problems in my, in, in my opinion. And you have that setup. So what yep. have you killed with that setup? Is an elk the biggest thing you've killed? Yeah. So, so elk, um, yeah, elk bears, you know, multiple bulls, uh, bears. Yeah. And, and so I'm a, I'm a big fan of that 1.5 and I like the 1.5. So it's got a shorter ferrule on it. It's, it's not as, it's not as long. Um, it's, it's a little bit shorter, the blades, the angle of them, they, they sweep back at less, uh, less of an angle. So basically when that, when that, when that broadhead's going in, you're getting 1.5 on a slap cut, but that thing's going in there a little ways before it's actually fully open. And I like that for penetration purpose because like on the 2.0, for example, it's a big ass hole right out of the gate. And don't get me wrong for turkeys, white tail, antelope. I mean, I've shot mule deer with those. Um, I've never had an issue, but the 1.5, if I'm going to go hunt like bears, let's say where, you know, I mean, I don't think people realize how, you know, that hide and all that hair and just all the bullshit you got to go through or elk, or if I was going to go hunt caribou or moose or something big like that, um, which I mean, God, one of these days I'm going to get the lucky tag draw and I'm going to go hunt that, hunt that stuff, or I'm going to get, just go break the bank and head up to Alaska and go do it. But regardless, yeah, no, you're right. The, the 1.5, I mean, that's been my, that's my go-to, especially if I'm going to hunt elk, just because, you know, the added, the added penetration that I'm going to get from that, I'm not losing nearly as much kinetic energy. It's still plenty big enough of a hole. I mean, I shot a bullet. 76 yards in Utah and got a damn pass through with that thing. And I had uh, my really good buddy, Devin Leonard and my other really good buddy, Jason Mackey with me on the mountain and watched the whole damn thing go down. And I mean, it was 76 yards downhill. Now, mind you, you know, again, I'm very confident at that, you know, uh, that range, that distance, the bull was feeding, everything was, everything was solid. And I know in the back of my mind, again, with my setup, I'm staying away from that fucking shoulder. Like it, it blows. <laughs> I used to always talk about this on, on, the, you know, a lot of the whitetail podcasts with WCB. Everybody likes to hold tight 
to that shoulder. I, I'm not that guy. I do not. I stay the fuck away from the shoulder. I'm a four to six inch minimum, if not even a little bit more, um, away from those shoulders. Because I know with my setup, if I hit the scap, especially if I'm into it more than an inch or two, I'm, I'm heading towards the center of it. I am totally fucked. And I know that because when I was younger, I screwed up on a couple of giant whitetails here in Ohio at 20 yards with a two inch rage and shot them fucking straight up right in the shoulder, aiming tight against that crease. Got three inches of penetration out of a 70 pound bow shooting. I mean, hell the, the one setup I was 450 grains. I didn't get any more penetration out of that arrow than I would have if I was shooting 410 or 560. It wouldn't have mattered. I went in three inches. It broke <laughs> off. The deer ran off, and three weeks later, I had him back in the same food plot hitting a fucking scrape, and you wouldn't even have known I did anything to him. So, you know, <laughs> for, for me, you know, I'm and, – and I get it. A lot of guys play the what-if game. And with bow hunting, you've got to play the – well, yes, you know sometimes bad things are going to happen. An animal takes a step, something happens. I totally get that. You know, I do. But I'm, I'm going on accuracy. I want, if, you know, I know I need to hold off that shoulder. So if my pin is on this one fucking hair, I want my arrow to hit that one hair. And all my setups are based on quiet, forgiving, and as fucking deadly accurate as I can get. So for me, that Sever 1.5, I've yet to shoot anything that for me I've got more confidence in. And, and, you know, out west, as much hunting out west as I do, rarely do I get to shoot 20 and 30-yard whitetail shots at shit out west. So that forces me to even play the accuracy game more because out there, I mean, shit. If you tell me I can shoot a mule deer at 40 yards, I'm like, oh, fucking hell yeah. That's like, not to say chip shot isn't being cocky, but I, I mean, a, a mule deer at 40, that's, oh, fuck, man. That's hell yeah. Give me that all day long. Whereas back here in the Midwest, if I tell my buddies, hey, there's a 170 right there at 40, kill it. They're like, fuck, that's far. God damn. Can't we get you? Know, well, I'm going to, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'll try it. You know, so it's, it's, it's just a different, it's a different world, and I've, I've grown to kind of adapt to that. So, so yeah, that, that 1.5, you know, the, and, and a lot of these broadhead companies, they offer broadheads that are built for different bow setups, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a one broadhead fits all type of thing when it comes to these mechanicals. I mean, you know, typically they've got broadheads that are, built for maybe lower poundage bows or lower kinetic energy bows. And then they've got some that are built, you know, like, for example, a guy like me, I love that 1.5 because when it comes to added penetration and helping me get more bang for my buck on punch, that thing is way better than the 2.0 for me on an elk, hands down, no question about it. Could I kill an elk with a 2.0? I've done it. I, I shot two bulls before the 1.5s came out, but – I'm going to tell you, as soon as they switched over and I could get my hands on that 1.5, I've never hunted elk with anything but that because I know it's giving me more confidence. I know that thing's going to penetrate better. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, can I say unraveling or unboxing this a little bit more when you talk about and, and uh, you know, for me and, and is and I think Clint would agree, I sneak into the shoulder more than Clint because I'm packing another 40 grains and another yeah. two inches of yep. draw now. Yep. I, sure. I, so I, and I, I've, I've been able to do that. And so knowing your limitations, but the, what if game, yep. I mean, you, I mean, the, what if game, just simple math, take the, what, what, how large the, the point of the shoulders are that you're going to potentially hit. And then mathematically take the stomach, liver, uh, diaphragm, guts, small and large yep. intestine, all that shit. You got a fucking much higher chance of hitting that. And oh yeah, smaller yep. the hole, less damage, less likely to find yep. it. So then when you yep. go into the shoulder, and this doesn't take a genius to figure it out, ask a ton of people that have hit the shoulder. You're probably not going through the fucking thing anyway. Now, no. if you want to nope. shoot a 700-grain arrow and lob logs, I mean, great, but that's more for shooting shit under a feed or under a static environment, not Western yeah. hunting. And I've had, yeah. you know, again, the same thing. People, 
hey, I, I, I shot this and it didn't go in far. And so I switched to a, you know, a 500 grain arrow and a fixed blade. And it's like, hey, if that's what you're comfortable with, by all means, that's what you should shoot. I just, as far as advice goes, and since Clint's setup is different than mine, you know, I personally, like I, I tell like accuracy, if you hit yep. it correctly, for the most part, you're going to be just fine. And occasionally, yep. right, there's going to be different times that you might pick something different th than a sever, than a mechanical. But, yes. I, I, you know, most, like mule deer, I'm shooting a two-inch, you know, uh, a yep. sever, an evolution broadhead, something with a massive cutting yep. diameter. Um, yep. Black bear, I personally, with my, I'm shooting the biggest cutting diameter I can because little fuckers don't bleed, and I'm going through it anyway. Yep. Mountain goat, yep. big, big hole, biggest cutting diameter I can. People are yep. like, oh man, they're really hairy, whatever. And I'm like, you can poke a fucking pencil through a mountain goat. It's not hard. And the bitches like to live and they die in cliffs. I want a big hole. Like I want. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing where it's like, hey, don't go, don't go online and listen to a dude that shot a doe last week. Um, like talk to guys that have shot multiple animals. Do you parallel, like, are you a Clint Casper guy? Well, listen to him. That'll help build confidence because he's confident and he gets shit done. But don't listen to guys that are that don't have a lot of weight under their belt, right, that, that haven't done a lot. And yep. again, if you're a Snyder guy, great, do what I do. But don't listen to a bunch of guys that haven't done shit because it's you're going to end up fucking yourself later and really regretting your your decisions. And I see it all all the time. And, and accuracy yep. is always going to win you know, as well. So if you talk to a guy that can't hit a bull in the ass with a bass fiddle, giving you advice, that may be why he shoots his specific setup where if you are extremely accurate, you know, your system may change greatly. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and, and just like you were talking about your setup and my setup, you know, I mean, that's like, even like, like on the bears thing, you know, I've had instances where I've gotten close to that damn, that, that scap, and they've got kind of almost like that damn gristle plate to them to where it's kind of like that meaty bullshit back there. You know, I've killed them with that 2.0, and then they've got a 1.75, so that's kind of a happy medium. I shot that last year, and I killed both my bears with that 1.75 because it's kind of the best of both worlds because, like you said, you do want the biggest cut you can get. So that 1.75, it's swept back a little more than the 2.0. So it's helping you out a little better on penetration, but it's got a bigger cut than the 1.5. And like last year I shot a bear in uh, Manitoba out of a tree stand. And then I shot a bear at, Oh, what was that fucker at? Uh, I was with Brian Barney and Dan Hevern in Montana. I shot a bear at, uh, I think he was 72, 70 or 72 feeding, flipping rocks and shot his ass heart shot him uh, and, and watched him freaking roll. And then he damn near rolled right down to me with, with those 1.75s. And they put huge holes and, you know, had pass-throughs, had a pass-through on my, my spot and stock bear. And I had, uh, I got into the opposite shoulder on my other bear, but great penetration, you know, so, but like you with, with two inches more of draw. And if you're pulling 75 or 80, I mean, oh yeah, fuck. I mean, you're going to punch that two through, no matter what. So, yeah, it's just, like you said, it, it's a matter of, I think so many guys, and, I, and I, I try to get back to everybody that DMs me questions because I know being in this game, um, I take it very personal on a good level that people trust in what I use, what I say, what I do, right? So, so I, I, I'm very humbled by that, and, and I take that, to the highest standard of appreciation. Like, I think it's, you know, it's awesome that people message me and I try to get back to everybody. Hey, what are you running for this? What are you running for that? Um, and I try to answer everybody, but every now and again, I'll run into a guy that man, he's constantly changing or, well, this guy's doing this. What do you think? Well, I don't know. I don't shoot the same setup as him. So I can't really answer that. I've never shot those broadheads. Okay. Well, hey, this, this guy's running these arrows. What do you think? Uh, dude, he's shooting a fucking 30-inch draw. I, I mean, I have no idea. I mean, I don't know, man. Those arrows probably work good for him, I guess. But I don't know. Like, I think the, the, where I'm going with this is I think guys get so crazy obsessed with 
what everybody else is doing, and, and that's okay because don't get me wrong, anytime I hunt with someone, if I go hunt with you, I go hunt with Brian Barney, I go hunt with my buddies, I, I go hunt mule deer with Devin Leonard, I'm always trying to pick up something new and learn something from somebody. There's always something to learn. But I think some guys, they get so fatuated with try this, test this, do this, do that, instead of actually just looking at, okay, here's my setup. Here's two guys, like you said, that shoot a similar setup to me. Let me ask these guys what they're doing. Like, sure, I'll try to help you out, but if you tell me you're shooting 80 pounds, 30-inch draw, what broadhead? Dude, I don't fucking know. I mean, I'm shooting 27 inches at a 70, you know, my bow's maxed out at 72 pounds, 71 and a half, whatever. I mean, we're not even in the same fucking stratosphere. So, like, yeah, I can try to help you, I guess, but, like, I'm basically just guessing because I don't shoot your setup. Like, I have no fucking clue what that, you know, what you got going on. Well, I get, I get a question every now and then, and when I say this, like, I appreciate, you know, guys asking questions that are new. Yeah, absolutely. But, but you know, when you get a guy... 32 inch draw length, 80 pounds. What broadhead? Whatever yep. fucking broadhead you want. You can shoot whatever. Yeah, you want. exactly. Like, yeah. Truly. Yeah. Like, shoot the biggest. Yep. Uh, can I hunt moose with a, uh, you know, Sever uh, Evolution, uh, Grim Reaper? I mean, pick it. Dude, yep. you could probably kill one with a fucking butter knife. Like, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, and so, <laughs> yeah no. I mean, and, and it, you know, it's, it's funny. Like, I've always said this, and I think some people, you know, I've gotten not backlash, but I've had guys be like, oh, yeah, it must be nice to be as good as you, like, to, to make that comment. And I'm not trying to be cocky or sound like an asshole, but if you hit them where you need to hit them, 99% of the time, they fucking die. It's just that simple. I mean, so for me, if I know I can't hit the shoulder, I got this white tail at 38 yards, he's broadside, he's feeding, okay, he's in a food plot, I need to be four to five inches off that shoulder, I'm going to be dead center in the middle of the lungs, maybe just a smidge off the center, I got the liver right there, like, I'm shooting that white tail there every fucking time, and that deer's not going to run 150 yards, topple over dead, as long as I do that, the deer's dying every time. I mean, if you hit them where they need to be hit, but if I get close to that shoulder and something happens and I hit the shoulder, I know I'm in trouble. I know I'm fucked. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it's honestly, it's a game of, I mean, bow hunting is a game of an inch either way. And it's a game of honestly, just a lot of it's common sense. I mean, if you know, you can't hit shoulders, get the hell away from the shoulders. I mean, just don't even, don't even, I, like I said, I don't even, I don't even get close to the damn shoulders because I know personally with my setup, that is, the, that is the no, no zone for me. If I hit a shoulder, I'm in trouble. Yeah. And uh, you know, when, when people, I, I, I yeah, cause I'm sure people there'll be shit stirred up about this podcast like anything else, but the, the bottom line, you just said it, you hit them where you're supposed to 99 and I'd say 99.9% of the time uh, yeah. they're dying. Right. And, even so you look at it this way, right? And in, in any once you if you start hanging around guys that are that are killers, the moment an arrow hits an animal, you're gonna probably hear somebody liver, you got liver, you're good. Liver, liver gut for yep. sure, liver gut. All right, what do we do? Well, let's give it some time, but yeah, it's probably yep. not gonna go more than a hundred yards. Well, okay, that that I've never seen a liver hit animal without bumping it go very far. Like right? they don't they don't like it. Hurts right. like a motherfucker, nope. they lay down. Yep. Okay. You don't yep. want to, you don't want to dive right in. Okay. All right. Yep. My, you hear me, I'm, I'm, I'm guiding Clint or Clint is guiding me hit that liver gut. You're going to say liver gut, dead animal. We're, we're solid. Sit down, chill. Clint hit yep. shoulder. You're going to hear me saying, fuck, fuck, fuck. Yeah. Exactly. And, fuck. Okay. Yep. And I don't give a shit if Jesus is behind that arrow, it's not going through like it's not. And nope. so, and this, and this is where I want people to take like this into context because Clint and I pretty much parallel everything is like, Hey, if you hit back, what are the potential outcomes? If you hit forward, what are the potential outcomes? Easy yeah. enough to test that. You don't even have to test shooting back. It's going into some shit, right? But test forward. Yeah. All right. Well, yep. first, if you can go to your local processor, if you got yep. one and beg him for some scapulas, give him a hundred bucks. Yep. It's worth a try. Okay, now shoot through a scapula with no meat with your broadhead. 
Then if you can, simulate some meat. It's not that big of a deal. But, you know, you can even just take blankets and you know, just put a few over the scab yeah. or something. And then see if you can get a shot out scab. So if you're like, hey, dude, go to your local processor. Hey, if a guy brings a scab in that's shot to shit and you're not saving it anyway, can you keep the meat on it? Talk to a cattle rancher, whatever. Moral of the story, you're not going through the fucking thing. You will find that really nope. quick. So nope. don't focus on the scapula. And and I mean, I don't want to get into that crazy ass shit with, I mean, I appreciate what was done back in the day uh, with yep. the Ashby Theory, Ashby Foundation. That was done with a fucking longbow, not yeah. with modern technology. Because I will say if my wife is going to Africa and she's going to shoot a henny animal, a big animal, a hundred percent, she's going to shoot a heavy, heavy arrow. Yep. Yep. But with technology, you are able to get away with more than you could back then. And people go super crazy about this, but it's like, okay, myself, Clint, Levi, pick a few other people, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of animals. All of our setups are more or less the same. Yep. They work, right? They work. I, not one killer yep. that I know, and I'm sure they're out there, but I'm, and, but I'm say, just saying, I don't know many people putting lots and lots of animals on the ground shooting a six, 700 grain arrow. Just bottom line. Yeah. They, you they know, hunt multiple I, animals. Yeah. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I shot, I was with, uh, with Gold Tip for years and, and got to be really good buddies with, with Tim Gillingham. Now, oh, he'll go him and I don't. End. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, like, you know, there's a lot that we agree on. There's some we disagree on, and that's okay. I mean, he has forgotten more about archery than I'll ever know, and that's fine. I am perfect. I mean, I consider myself very well-rounded with archery, but that dude's on a whole other fucking level. He's on a level I don't even want to be on, if I'm being honest with you. He makes my head hurt. Um, love the guy to death, but he's told me so many times, and I've heard this, and, I mean, he goes all over and proves it and kills shit. A 400 grain arrow, kill anything you want. Kill anything you want. I mean, and, you know, I, I, I've, I've heard him joke about the, oh, I'm going elk hunting, I need 575 grains. And he's like, why? And I'm like, no, I, I agree. Like, why? What? What? Why? Like, what the hell do you need that? You know, I mean, and so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, I'm one of those guys that this is what works good for me. And I've tried heavier arrows. I've tried different broadhead. You know, I've tried certain things. But I think when it all comes down to it at the end of the day, if you want to be good at bow hunting, you got to learn your setup and be confident in it. And confidence will equal killing. That's just all there is to it. I mean, if you're, if you're walking around, you know, when I go on a hunt, do I fill every tag? Fuck no, I don't. But do I expect – Every day when I wake up and go out, today's the day I'm fucking killing one today. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm walking around hungry and waiting on an opportunity. And I mean, I've said this on a lot of podcasts, you know, my mindset is that shooter mentality and it's taken me a long time to get there. But if you let me bend the limbs back, you're in trouble. And I think if you can get that mentality, now, do I miss shots? Do I botch shots? Oh, fuck yeah, absolutely. But my point is, is if you stand there at 82 yards and you say, hey, Clint, go ahead and hit me, fuck, man, you're in trouble because I'm going to fucking hit you. I mean, I just, I mean, like, that's just, that's just where the confidence is at. And that has been with trial and error. That's been because of failure. That's been because I've done this, tried that. Like, I know for me what works, what's accurate. I know my setup. And that's why, you know, hey, a lot of shit dies from guys that are confident. You have guys like you, guys like Levi. Look at, look at Brian Barney. You know, uh, me and Brian are really good friends, hunt a lot together. He's got almost an identical bow set up to me. Almost identical, air, you know, when it comes to bow, draw length, weight. Um, we always bounce back and forth on, hey, how much weight are you running up front on your stabilizer? What are you running for a back bar? Like, we're, you know, because we're very similar on everything. I mean, that guy shoots fucking 25 animals a year, and it's with – mechanicals and it's with a 430 grain arrow and it's i mean and it's a 27 inch draw bow and i mean that dude's going all over the world killing everything and it's just like you know but that guy's got a very similar setup to me so i can bounce ideas off of him but if you're like you said if you're a guy that's hey my draw is 29 and a half and i'm shooting a 700 grain log what broadhead should i shoot clint huh man 
shoot, like you said, shoot whatever the hell you want. I have no idea because I don't run that, but shoot a freaking tennis ball on the end of that thing, and you're probably going to kill something with it. Well, and that's that's a good like you brought up Brian because um, you get you get Dan Picard and Brian both and you you guys are all somewhat vertically you know challenged and not drawn back a, a a ton of weight. I mean, seventy pounds is a good amount of weight. Don't I'm not I'm, yeah. I shouldn't say that with technology. The old eighty five is the new seventy, and I'm oh, yeah. generally in the seventy five, eighty to eighty five range. And yep. people. I have good shoulders. I, and so keep that in mind. Like if you don't, don't do that, but I'm getting up there in age and I still have solid shoulders. And so I shoot what I'm most comfortable with, meaning I yep. shoot the most poundage I can and still yep. drill shit at long distances, draw back, sitting down, cold weather, all the shit people tell you to do. So why would you shoot more poundage compared to less? One, I will take what some people would consider unethical shots. And you're like, what do, you, what do you mean? I'm like, I love that corner and two shot. Not crazy quartering two, but I like right. the frontal. I like the quartering two. I like to sneak yep. it into my close side pocket so it blows straight through, cuts the heart in half, generally exits out the right behind the offside shoulder. I yep. will take an extreme quartering away shot, and I might clip the rear ham, but more than most likely, I might be going in a little bit to the gut bag, might have some grass in there, small as large intestine, hitting the liver up into the lungs, Burying into the offside shoulder. Yep. A little more poundage isn't going to hurt. You don't have to have it. Nope. But if I'm accurate with it, I'm going to do that. Having said that, now I'm also might have a two inch cutting diameter broadhead on there rather than a one five, going to take a little bit more ass, more, more damage. So why I'm bringing all this up when you talk to Tim Gillingham, if you're fucking five six with a 27 inch draw, don't listen to a lot of what he says. He's got a 34 inch draw. His setup's yep. different. Now the knowledge behind Clint, listen to all of that. But if you hear yep. if you if you hear him say something, you gotta keep in mind he's shooting a 34 inch draw length. Oh yeah. A light yep. arrow for him is 480 because he's got to shoot yep. a full length shaft. This is why it's so important to listen to people that parallel your body size, your style, your hunting set style, everything else. Yep. Because you'll just get bad info. I'm like a happy medium, dude, which is kind of where you're at. I don't want to be too yeah. heavy. I don't want to be too light. I want to be between 270 and 285. And I don't want to spend hours upon hours tuning my fucking bow. And when I say that, I love tuning my bow. But if it comes slightly out of tune, I don't want to be so paranoid my broadhead's not hitting because I'm shooting 320 feet per second, right? And I want a quiet bow. So that's why I stay in yep. that rail. And that's kind of where you and I think Picard shoots a little bit faster of an arrow, but you and Barney are about identical from what I understand. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I mean, and like I said, you know, I probably, the way I shoot, I probably, you know, I'm five, nine, five, 10. I could probably shoot a little longer and I've tried a little longer draw length. Like I've shot 27 and a half and I'll be honest for me, it, it just, it, I just, and I'm sure if I shot it long enough, I could get used to it, but I just, the way I shoot, the way I push and pull, I'm a little, I, I like a little bit of a shorter draw than most people would with, with my given height and, and everything. And it's like, you know, that's just what works good for me. Now, everybody that's super worried about, you know, oh, I want to, you know, I mean, I've had guys tell me, Hey, I'm going on an elk hunt. I'm going to, I'm going to shoot a, bow, shoot a bow that's an inch longer so I can get, you know, I can run a heavier arrow and blah, 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 and do all this crazy shit. And they're like, what do you do? What do you change from your white tail to your elk setup? And I'm like, I set a bow up before turkey season, and that setup is what I run for turkeys, bear. This summer it'll be axis, mule deer, antelope, white tails, and elk. The same fucking setup for the entire year, and I've been doing that for probably 12 years. And yeah, they're like, same. There's no way. There's there's no way. And I'm like, man, <laughs> if you don't want to believe me, you don't have to. But like, I don't need to go change all this stuff to go from an elk to a mule deer to an antelope or a turkey or you know i just i set it up and i get right in that happy medium where i know i'm good and and that, and that's kind of like what tim was saying yeah he's got a a, a 40 freaking inch draw but he was like clint anybody that has a 400 420 430 he's like if you're in that realm of the world he's like that will go kill anything, whether you're shooting 27 inch, 28 inch. Sure. Could you shoot longer? Could you shoot heavier? Yeah, you can if you want, but he's like, 
I don't know why guys want to shoot 700 grain arrows. And, and I, like I said, I'm, I'm like that too. I just, for that's just not for me. It, it's just, you know, I shot an arrow that was, I think 512 grains, I think was the heaviest I've ever shot. Or maybe it was four, nine, I, I don't know, somewhere right around 500. And I did that for about three months. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't fucking like this. You want to listen to guys that are, are running something similar to you, you know, and, and it's the same with all kinds of gear. You know, like I get, I get questions all the time about, Hey, what's your sleep system? What are you running for boots? Um, you know, uh, what, what pack are you running from Kfaru? What frame, what this? And it's like, again, a lot of that stuff, man, what works good for me or what works good for the next guy may be something you absolutely hate. You know, like for example, you know, I'm uh, prime example. Me and Brian hunt together a lot. Brian will crawl up in a fucking deer, uh, a deer bed, and you give him uh, a freaking puppy jacket to put over him, and he'll curl up and fucking go to bed like that. Me, I mean, I want some type of a shelter. I like a nice pad. I mean, I'm not saying I I need a, you know, I need a freaking a, a Motel Eight up there by any means, but you know. It, if I can run up, you know, if I, if I'm going to pack an extra pound so I can sleep better, I'm definitely going to do that. But, you know, like Brian, I mean, you know, I've seen him curl right up and just fall asleep and it's no big deal. Me, it's hard for me to sleep sometimes. I need a little more comfort than what he would need. You know, I mean, uh, me on, on, on footwear, you know, I run a technical mountaineering boot. Brian Barney in the dead ass of winter, is running a fucking Solomon style running shoe with maybe gaiters over him just to keep himself from getting wet. Meanwhile, I'm running 200 or 400 gram boots that are like a mountaineering boot. That guy's running like a, basically a fucking tennis shoe. I mean, I've seen him pack elk out with basically a running shoe where most people wouldn't make it a mile without blowing their ankles out. I mean, just totally different, you know? And I mean, yeah, he's, you know, he's lighter and a little shorter than me, but I mean, we're not that far off each other. I mean, I'm, I'm taller and weigh about 40 pounds more, but not like, it's not like I'm six, five and he's only five, six, you know, but just, just like that, you know, he loves, you know, he doesn't need a ton of ankle support. He doesn't need a ton of this or that, you know, and it's like, yeah, you, you just got to mimic, you know, Hey, this guy runs this. I'm going to try it. Maybe I'll like it. Maybe I won't, you know, but uh, yeah, good old trial and error and just figuring stuff out. I, I think, I think you brought up a good point, the easy button. I think in today's world, everyone is looking for a quick way to the best bow setup, a quick way to beat target panic, a quick way to hunt mule deer, a quick way to get good at killing elk. And I mean, yeah, there's a lot of info out there and there's a lot of, of good people you can talk to, but none of that erases just good old flat out, hey, I'm just going to go do it and try it, and it's either going to work or it's not, and if I get my ass kicked, I'm going to obviously have to change something up. Yeah, and yeah, uh, that is how, that's how I, you know, learned. That's how a lot of people, you know, a little bit, I, I, I hate to say younger generation. It's just the one reason why I can land nav is I didn't have a GPS growing up in, a, in the right. military learning right. how to land nav. reason I can judge yardage, we didn't have range finders, right? I yep. didn't know how. Uh, you know, as far as like, uh, you know, other like um, whether you're poor or a timeline of when you were born or whatever. But we had green military foam pads, shitty camp trails, frame backpacks, you know, and so yep. you end up one appreciating, you know, things and two kind of learning like, OK, you know, shelter wise, like if something goes wrong, if you've kind of learned the hard way or the poor, the poor yeah. man's way going in, if something goes yep. wrong with your really good shit, you can probably figure it out. Um, oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. So something to think about, but, um, but man, I should probably let you go. I got to go to a doctor's appointment and I've been talking to you for an hour and a half, half now. So, and, uh, it's calving season and you got the shits. Actually, we didn't, I didn't record that. Uh, everybody thank Clint because he did this podcast with Giardia. So that's gotta be rough. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's really fun. I would recommend it. This is my like second or third time having it. Um, it's, it's definitely a good time. Uh, it's, it's a hell of a good time. It's, it's, it's a shit full of fun. No pun intended. <laughs> gotcha. Well, dude, I appreciate you hopping on here truly as well. Friendship and support. Um, yeah, it's been good knowing you're a funny fucker. So I was happy to get you on the podcast. So 
Hey, absolutely, man. I was stoked stoked to get on it. Yeah, man, it's uh, it, it's always always a good time, and we get to bullshit. And then, yeah, I guess for whatever reason, people want to hear us uh, want to hear us. So you hit the record button, and yeah, just uh, make sure you put the rated R center on there, and we'll be good to go. You won't you won't get cancel cultured if you do that, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, I've learned. Yeah, I learned that a long time ago. But you're a hundred percent. Oh yeah, correct. me too. Yeah, I've learned that the hard <laughs> way. <laughs> oh shit, cool, man. Right on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks again, Aaron. See ya.